many species of animals are going extinct per year, and how does this compare to, say, 100 years ago? And, and tell us more about why that matters. Scientists are telling us that we're currently in the world's sixth great extinction. School children everywhere know about the dinosaurs and how they're no longer on, on Earth. Well, today's rates of extinction, species lost, um, compared to new, new species being found, um, extinction is outpacing new species. So the rate of die-off is, is unprecedented in the, in the geological or the historical record. Are we running out of chemicals needed for agriculture and growing food? I wouldn't say we're, we're running out of chemicals in that there's going to be shortages in the next five or ten years. Um, there are certain chemicals that we use to grow food, nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, um, and uh, some of them are, nitrogen is generally synthesized. Um, so we can continue to make more, although it's an energy intensive process. Um, but when you look at mines for, for phosphorus, you know, it's a depletable resource. Um, so if we continue to use more and more of it, eventually there, there could be a crunch. It's not necessarily in the, in the near, near term, but um, enterprising farmers are finding ways to grow more food without the heavy use of these synthetic chemicals in part by restoring the natural nitrogen cycle. So historically, you'd have a farm and it would be a mixed use farm. So you'd be growing your crops, but you also might have some livestock or other things on hand and you could take their waste product and use it to help fertilize the soil or do things like composting and, and re help regenerate soils that way. Um, so if we want to um, reduce our dependency on these uh, synthetic chemicals or chemicals you have to mine to put onto crops, I think there's ways to do agriculture um, more responsibly. On that note, should we switch to all organic farming? It would be uh, hard to impossible to switch to all organic farming um, overnight. Uh, most of the world's major food crops, the wheat, rice, and corn that are the main foodstuff of humanity. Um, they're largely produced in industrial-sized operations that are able to get the scale going to, to meet the meet current demands. Um, it would be a tough sell to turn those all organic um, overnight. I think as time progresses, I think we'll start to see more um, Changes in agriculture, I think a lot of small farmers are looking to figure out how they can do things organically. Large-scale organic operations are, are, are uh, sprouting up, for particularly for high-value crops, um, your berries or your lettuces, that sort of thing. It's, it's harder to do the quantities of, of wheat, rice, and corn that are currently the food stuff of <laughs> sustaining civilization. Um, at large scale organically. Now that brings into question, are those large scale industrial operations really what we want for the health of humanity and for the health of the planet? And, and that's, a, that's a bigger question, I think. How quickly can we switch to alternative energy completely and how realistic is it? Is it, is it too late? It's definitely not too late to switch to renewable energy. I think we're seeing the change happen rapidly in a number of places. Um, already a number of major economies, including the United States, Australia, a number of European countries are already past peak coal. That means coal use is going down. Meanwhile, use of, of alternatives to coal and natural gas is increasing, but also wind and solar are increasing at incredibly rapid rates. Um, this transition, when it first started, it was really policy driven. Um, it took heavy policies in a number of European countries like Germany, um, pushing for, for solar and wind through various mechanisms like a feed-in tariff, paying producers of renewable energy. But right now, costs of solar and wind production have fallen so much that they're competitive with fossil fuels in a growing number of markets around the world. So this transition, um, whether we like it or not, is going to continue. And, and so we will see more and more renewable energy um, on grids and then in off-grid situations like putting solar on places that are, are not connected to major electrical grids. 
a lot of the utilities uh, were trying to fight this transition, but um, I think they're seeing the handwriting on the wall right now, and utilities know that their business will not look the same in the next 25 years. Would everyone giving up animal products and switching to a whole food plant-based diet be the most powerful action step we could take? People often ask what they can do personally to make, make things better, help to improve the environment. And one of those things is to, to change your diet, to eat lower on the food chain, so eat fewer um, animal products, less meat, milk, and eggs, and, and more uh, plant-based sources of energy. So that's certainly a personal action people can take. That alone will not solve all of our climate problems, but I think it's something that helps people feel engaged. And, and indeed, um, it was seen in the United States, meat consumption is actually going down, um, which, which most people don't know on a total basis and on a per person basis. So I think people are starting to adopt the change, whether it's for their own personal health reasons or for the environment or for cost, because um, meat tends to be fairly expensive. Uh, so so it, it's definitely a way to reduce your personal environmental footprint. Um, Animal livestock production tends to be uh, fairly greenhouse gas intensive, particularly beef production, uh, ends up releasing a lot of methane, which is a powerful climate changing greenhouse gas into the atmosphere. Um, so, so if people want to lighten their load, they can certainly move, move lower down the food chain. It's helpful for climate reasons. It's also helpful when you think about how many people the earth can sustain with current food production levels. Uh, crunching the numbers at looking at how much how much grain um, grain is fed to because grain is fed the main feed for our livestock um, grain and soybeans how much grain and soy we're currently producing well we see if everybody were to switch to a meat intensive diet like we eat in America the world could sustain only about two billion people based off of current production levels so you can see if everybody tried to eat high in the food chain, uh, would easily uh, outgrow our planet. Um, now lower on the food chain are diets like you see commonly in India where vegetarian diets are, are more common. Um, if everybody ate closer to Indian levels where they get most of their calories directly from grains as opposed to converting that grain into livestock products, um, you'd see that the planet could support about 10 billion people. So right now we're at seven and a half billion people. So unless we come up with major new revolutions on how to produce food from a limited supply of land, I think we'll all need to meet somewhere, somewhere in the middle and eat fewer animal products. How close are we to a food shortage? It depends, it depends where you are. Some parts of the world are already experiencing food shortages, whether it's from harvest shortfalls um, or whether it's for political reasons. Um, right now you can look at Venezuela and see people lining up uh, for hours just to get basic food stuff because of the crumbling of their political situation. Overall, um, the world currently has plenty of food if it's able to distribute it well and distribute it equitably. Um, but it doesn't take much to create problems in the food system. You know, over the last, since 2007, 2008, um, where if you get major, major crop shortfalls in major producing areas, food prices can rise um, very quickly. This happened in 2007 and 8. It happened again in 2010. Um, in 2007, 2008, we were seeing protests around the world as food prices rise. And um, in Indonesia, people were taken to the streets, tens of 10,000 people in Tempe protests. In Mexico, there were tortilla riots as corn prices were rising. Um, in, in a number of dozen, several dozen countries, we were seeing protests. And then in, again, in 2010, uh, wheat prices rise, and, and that's been linked to the, the Arab Spring, the uprising, causing people to take to the streets and say, what's happening? Why, why are we not having food? What's wrong with our governments? Um, larger, broader political scales. But food tends to be um, a spark that can, can incite people 
uh, into unrest. And it's one of the major, the government's major responsibilities is making sure everybody can be wide fed. So with growing populations, growing consumption levels, and production not growing quite as quickly, we find we can have these shocks more frequently, perhaps in the past when we had a larger buffer and it was easier to put more food onto market. So it's really a question of food prices more than food supply. So when food prices spike, uh, people in the United States generally don't have problems because as much. When we're paying for food, say you buy a loaf of bread or a box of cereal, it's a pocket change is what's actually going to the price of of grain in those items. Whereas if you're in uh, India buying rice or Mexico buying corn for your tortillas, you're paying, you're paying directly for that grain. And you're probably paying 50, 60, even 70% of your income for food. So it makes a big difference when food prices double overnight as we saw um, in recent years.